Let's do that hockey. You're listening to Dauber Prospects Radio, episode 132. I'm your host, Peter Harling. And yes, hockey is back. We have our off-season players who have changed locations, contracts, free agents, trades, all that fun stuff's happened. We've done our homework. We bought our guides. Um, tweet at me what your favorite fantasy guide is, by the way. I'd love to know. Is it the Forecaster magazine? Is it Dauber Prospects? Uh Prospects Guide, is it the Dauber Hockey Fantasy Guide, is it the McKean's Eurobook, is it the Hockey News, uh, tweet at me, uh, at DPR, score, uh, uh, DPR underscore show, uh, or at P Harling, P-H-A-R-L-I-N-G, and tell me what your favorite fantasy guide is. I'm really curious to know what, what kind of guides people like to use. And uh, so we've been watching rookie camps, prospect tournaments, NHL preseason, painstakingly, uh, getting us to our, our fantasy drafts or th- through to the start of the season. We've done our research, and now it's now it's for real. Now the games are on. Our rosters are selected. There's some uh, heartbreak in the draft, no doubt, as the player you had on your radar went a pick or two before you. There'll be a couple of celebrations of guys you are very happy you got. Now that the season started, there'll be some players who are even more excited because they made the NHL. Maybe some guys who are disappointed because they were sent down. Uh, like Nathan Smith. Uh, But let's take a look at what's happening in the hockey world early, early, early in the season. So let's start at the top and work our way down. Let's talk about some players who are in the NHL. Uh, These will all be rookies, uh, guys who you might have targeted very early in your dynasty redrafts and entry drafts or prospect drafts, uh, players that you've uh, been stashing on your bench for a year or two, perhaps maybe even longer. Uh, so first place we got to start, it's got to be Maddie Veneers. Seattle Kraken, um, first overall uh, franchise selection back in the 2021 draft. Went back to college, um, finished the year really strong in the NHL and has picked up right where he left off. So he's already 96% fan tracks owned. So there's a uh, high percent of ownership here on this player. But in three games, he's got a goal and three assists. So he's four points in three games. That's outstanding. Seven shots on goal. He's got a power play point. He's got 18 faceoff wins. Um, multicat leagues. He's doing everything you could have hoped for uh, early, early, early. It's only three games. Can he sustain this over 20, 40, 60, 80 game pace? That's Remains to be seen. There'll be some droughts along the way, but so far, all signs are pointing to Maddie Beniers as a fantasy hockey stud. We're talking like Jonathan Tabes in his prime kind of good here. So that's something to be really excited about if you own him. And if you do, and people are coming at you with trade offers, just say no. Just no. You can't have him. Another player who had a lot of buzz coming out of the World Juniors after the season he had is Anaheim Ducks top prospect Mason McTavish. Keep in mind, Mason is still eligible for the Ontario Hockey League. He's got one more year left to play there, uh, so the American Hockey League is not an option. But so far, it looks like it's the NHL all the way for him. He dominated junior last season, all the way to the Memorial Cup and a World Junior gold medal. He's got two points in two games with the Ducks so far, still looking for his first goal this season, but he's got six shots on goal. He's got a power play point. Little disappointed with his um, lack of peripherals, uh, basically non-existent hits or blocks anywhere. Um, So that's something that I would kind of like to see uh, a little bit better, Um, but it looks like Mason McTavish is is off to a hot start in the NHL. Two points in two games means there's no reason to consider making him a healthy scratch or consider sending him back to junior. I think he's he's here to stay. He's 77% fan tracks owned, so there's a small window of opportunity for ownership there if you're in deep leagues. Uh, particularly if you if you count the multi cats, just because he doesn't have any right now. Trust me, he'll get some. Uh, a couple more NHL prospects. Uh, rookies to talk about, I should say. Uh, J.J. Paterka came over to the uh, North America last year, kicked down the front door of the American Hockey League, scoring about a point a game there. He's tenacious, he's aggressive, he's 
good four checker. He's a good two way player. He plays a super pro game. And he's already got two points in two games as well. A goal and assist, four shots on goal. Uh, Buffalo's going to have a hard time keeping him off the roster and sending him back to um, to Rochester. Uh, he looks like he's in the NHL to stay. So here's a player, a prospect, who's 31% fan track zone. So there's a lot of opportunity to own him. He's a pretty hot commodity. If you're looking at trading for him, you might have to pay through the nose a little bit. Maybe you can catch someone who's sleeping on him who's not convinced that he's going to stay the year. Um, yeah, he's uh, he looks like he's here to stay. The biggest surprise out of rookies in the NHL for me this year has been a player I've talked about a couple times on the podcast before. So hopefully with any luck, you, you caught me talking about Arbor Jack Eye. Uh, and you have been ahead of the curve by listening to this podcast and and picked him up. So his last name is spelt X H E K A J. With how do you get Jack Eye out of that? I don't even I don't even know. If you, if it's phonetically it's closer if you spell it backwards, it looks like it would be closer to Jack Eye. Anywho how, this guy's a beast. He's a undrafted prospect in the Ontario Hockey League. Got a walk on audition for a team. I think it was Kitchener. He made it. Uh, he's a Hamilton native who ended up getting traded to Hamilton for their run last year. And, you know, he's just gotten better all the way. He got invited to Montreal Canadiens training camp. He was dominant for Hamilton last year and was a really key part on their blue line, leading them to a, a OHL championship and uh, and looked really strong in the Memorial Cup. Comes in, uh, gets signed by the Canadians in in last season early on, and uh, comes into this off season in their prospect and rookie camps, and really really stood out. Made a noise for himself. He uh, took his toll on a couple Ottawa Senators prospects two years in a row now. I think it was it was Jack I who took care of uh, Pinto last season, knocking him out, and I think he injured someone again this season. So he's public enemy number one in Ottawa. Uh, what his uh, NHL upside looks like would be kind of something along the lines of I'm I'm gonna compare him to uh, Radko Gudis kind of player, big, mean, physical, kind of limited on the offensive upside. Uh, he did get his first NHL point last night, so he's got an assist in three games. Uh, he's getting good minutes, uh, playing with I believe his partner's David Savard. So he's you know he's getting a regular rotation. Not getting very many power play minutes, if any, um, but uh, but that's okay. And he's looked really great out on the ice. He's got four penalty minutes. That's a number that I think will will go up pretty quickly here. I think some as soon as he plays Ottawa, someone's going to want to drop the mitts with them. Uh, they might regret it when it happens. He's a pretty tough customer. Uh, he's got four shots on goal, 13 hits, and seven blocks. And there is the bread and butter with Arbor Jack Guy. He's going to be a hits and blocks monster he's only 14 percent fan tracks owned so lots of uh, ownership opportunity there another player who got a lot of uh, lip service and and keyboard time this summer was uh, Andre Kuzmenko Vancouver Canucks prospect they signed him as a free agent that makes him a prospect uh, so he's coming over from the KHL after having a really good season uh, I think he finished like second in scoring in the KHL he looked pretty good for Vancouver in their summer camps and preseason. Um, now that we're into the regular season, he's got two games under his belt. He's got one power play goal, uh, and he's playing on a line with Pedersen and um, Hoglander. So he's getting really good deployments. He's made the team. He's getting good deployment. The concern this summer with him is you got these guys coming from Russia, and they can be hit or miss like big time swings and you can totally whiff and get a player like Shipashev who just didn't pan out at all or worst case scenario uh, Nikita Gusev who came over two or three years ago couldn't really crack any roster bounced around uh, just never really never really was able to translate his offense in North America uh, but then you get guys like Panarin who are fantastic and you know kind of come out of nowhere and are superstar players so i think kuzmenko best case scenario looks like he's going to be somewhere between uh gusev 
and Panarin. Now, somewhere in the middle. I think, you know, if we can if we can get 40, 50 points out of him this season, that would be pretty good. His ownership's pretty high, 72%. Um, so I think right now the jury is still quite out on what we have here. It's only been two games. Um, can he hold on to that plum spot on that first or second line, whatever you, you call that in Vancouver? Um, can he keep producing Remains to be seen, but it's certainly someone to keep an eye on. Put him on your watch list or, or pick him up if you can drop him for free because he'll be minor eligible on, on fan tracks. Uh, so let's let's move down and talk about the, the next level down. The American Hockey League is uh, slow to start compared to the NHL. Um, they, they just got going this, this weekend for the most part. So there's only been one or two games played so far. Um, so you might be scanning the scoring leaders for the American Hockey League, looking for some guys who are out of the gate hot and you think might get a recall. One piece of advice I'll give you with that is watch out for players who need to go through waivers to come back up. Uh, so I'm talking about guys like Jace Howerluck, uh, Glenn Godden with the Ottawa Senators and Anaheim Ducks, TJ Tynan, uh, Los Angeles Kings, and a couple of... Tampa Bay, Syracuse players, and Alex Barr, Boulay, and Rifus. Uh, those guys all would need to go through waivers to come back up. So it's unlikely that the team wants to risk exposing them to waivers, uh, just kind of leave them in the minors and let them lead their AHL affiliate and, and provide some, some support there. Now, here's a couple of players who would not need to clear through waivers uh, that you might want to keep your eye on. Simon Edmondson, a lot of conversation about him being uh, the Red Wings' next Rookie of the Year candidate because if he could follow in their Mo Sider's footsteps. So far, not so much. He did not make the Detroit Red Wings roster. He was reassigned to Grand Rapids, but the defenseman has four points in two games down there, and he's only 45% owned. So he's a prime candidate for someone who could get recalled in, in short order. We'll see how he does once that happens and he comes up to the NHL. Another player we talked about on this podcast recently, I wrote a little bit about him in the McKean's yearbook and other places, Anton Levchi, another European import free agent player, um, leading scorer from the league of last season. Florida Panthers signed him. He did not make the Panthers roster, so he's been sent down to Charlotte, and the left wingers got three points in two games there. So that's 2% fan tracks owned overall. Really good player to maybe put on your watch list or stash him on your prospect bench if you have a spot and you got a deep prospect roster, someone who you can maybe keep till next year. Uh, if this isn't the year that he makes it, it could be next year. Um, you don't have to hold on to him for a long time to find out. I think you've got one and a half seasons tops before you know if you're fishing or cutting bait with this prospect. Couple Los Angeles Kings prospects. Uh, Jordan Spence um, is only got one game played so far. He's uh, in Ontario. He's got three points in one game. Last time I checked, that was good. Uh, he's 20% fan tracks owned. And it looks like Brant Clark is in the NHL, not in the American Hockey League. So um, he's the other Los Angeles Kings prospect making his NHL debuts still eligible to return to junior but it's kind of starting to look like Brant Clark ain't going back to junior he could be in the NHL to stay as well uh college hockey let's talk about one or two guys playing in the NCAA they are off to their start as well they've had uh just a handful of games but a couple of players who are standing out to me that really popped. You've got Adam Fantilli with the University of Michigan and Mackie Samuskevich with Michigan as well. Michigan continues to be an all-star roster. Um, just as good, but we got a new cast of characters in some cases. Mackie Samuskevich was there last year. He returns Florida Panthers prospect. Uh, so he'll be playing a more prominent role on the team than he did last year. Uh, he is... They've got three games played in Michigan. So Samus Gavich is 11% fan tracks owned. And he's got six points in three games with four goals and two assists. So he's rocking the two-point-a-game performance early out of the gate. And I don't really anticipate that that's going to really slow down too, too much. I think he'll 
be less than two points a game by the time the dust settles at the season, but he could very easily be above a point a game. Now, Adam Fantilli is a freshman. This is his first season in the NCAA, and he is a top prospect for the entry draft coming up in Nashville in 23. The only question I really have is where does he end up going in the top three. I think right now it's a slam dunk that Connor Bernard is, is going first overall and it would take acts of God to change that. Where the debate really begins is at second overall, you've got uh, the Russian kid who's under contract for five years, Matej Michkov. So that might sour some teams from investing the second overall pick if you can get someone pretty much just as good and Adam Fantilli, who could be one and done and ready to step into your roster and this time next year. Uh, so Adam Fantilli, off to a hot start, 2.33 points per game. He's got one goal and six assists in three games for seven points. Last time I checked, that was also pretty good. Uh, a couple more players to kind of keep an eye on. Uh, Boston Bruins have a really thin prospect pool. And one of their prospects who is kind of coming up quick is Riley Duran. Uh, he's playing center for Providence right in the Bruins' backyard, so they'll be able to keep real close tabs on him. He's got four goals and assists for five points, also three games played there, 1.67 points per game. And his fan tracks ownership couldn't be lower, 0%. Uh, so there is a hot tip for a prospect who you might want to scoop up and put on your prospect bench or at least your watch list. Um, I expect that he won't be in the NHL next year. He's got another year or two of development coming, but he's a player who could uh, who could start trending up real, real quick uh, and become a pretty prominent prospect. He doesn't have a lot of competition in a shallow prospect pool in Boston. One more player from the NCAA to talk about, um, Matthew Nyes. Um, this will tie in with a point that I'll talk about in a little bit later. Uh, but Leafs left wing, uh, University of Minnesota, the Golden Gopher, in the Frozen Four last year. He had a great freshman season. A lot of fans in Leafland were like, sign him now, sign him now. Uh, but he chose to return for his sophomore year. Uh, off to a good start. Two goals and an assist for three points in four games with the Gophers. And he'll be looking to chase down that... Um, Frozen Four Championship this season, uh, and it's very likely that he'll turn pro at the end of the season. So let's skip to that other point I wanted to talk about. A uh, little bit of the Maple Leafs talk here. There are 50 contracts, so they're at their limit, and they've got some maneuvers to make. They're up against the cap. They're no contract room. They're gonna want to sign Matt Nyes at the end of the season. And they have a couple goalies in the system as well who they might want to try and get under contract um, to help with their injury situation. So Matt Murray is out. It looks like it's going to be a couple of weeks at least that he'll be gone for. Joseph Wall, the starting goalie in the Marlies, is also still injured and recovering. So they got a couple holes. You got Ilya Samsonov holding down the starting position in the NHL. And you know, he looked a little shaky early on, um, but he's kind of... Kind of settled down a little bit, so he could be good to go as the starter there, but he's going to need some relief. And they've recalled Shelgren, who came out of nowhere uh, last season when the Leafs were in a similar situation, and he looked good. But what does that leave them in the Marlies? Well, they've got uh, a couple of prospects in Europe, but they've also got a couple of prospects who are under AHL contract, so those don't count towards the 50 cap. And that's Keith Petruzzulli and Dryden McKay. Now, I've spoke about both these guys on the podcast before, but Keith Petruzzulli is, um, he was drafted in 2017 in the third round by Detroit. Uh, he played his uh, junior hockey in the NCAA with Quinnipiac and was very good uh, near the end. You know, he's kind of so-so in the first couple of years, but he really got his game together. Uh, but Detroit chose not to sign him. He became a free agent, and he ended up in, in the Toronto's system. But because he signed to an AHL contract, either of these guys are, are actually eligible to be signed anywhere, um, but not in Toronto because they have their contract limit. So they have to move a player out. 
Petrozuli got the, the start for the Marley's home opener this weekend, and the six foot five, 23 year old goalie was the first star of the game. Everyone who watched the game and was tweeting about it was really raving about his performance. Um, and he's been a prospect who I've really been kind of interested in. He's kind of struggled at times, but goalies can sometimes do that. They can be slow to develop. Um, and then once they kind of get into their mid-20 range, they really start to put it together. And he is currently 23 years old. So I like the possibility of him kind of turning into something here. The Leafs just need to find a way to make the contracts and money work. The other guy I mentioned, Dryden McKay, also a college uh, free agent, come undrafted, was never drafted in the NHL. Uh, but he had like unworldly numbers playing for, um, he was Minnesota State, man, Mantaco. Um, didn't get a lot of shots against, so his shots against volume would be as low as 15 in some games. Uh, so that kind of skews his, his record a little bit and his stats. It kind of artificially inflates it when you're playing on a team that gives up so few shots. All you need to do is, you know, not let in two goals, basically, and, and you should be in a good position to win. Uh, but he won the Hobie Baker in his final season as a senior last year. Um, didn't win the Goalie of the Year award. That went to um, Devin Levi of the Buffalo Sabres. And pretty much everyone who follows college prospects really closely thought that Devin Levi really should have won both awards. And that it was kind of more of a lifetime achievement award for Dryden McKay. Um, and then kind of skewing that announcement that he won the Hobie Baker um, shortly after the Frozen Four concluded and... Uh, he ended up testing positive for a banned substance that he was somehow able to prove not his fault because it wasn't a listed ingredient on whatever he consumed that caused him to fail the test. So he was suspended until just recently, uh, unable to play or practice in preseason uh, or rookie or prospect tournaments with Toronto. So he started his professional career in the ECHL. I think it's the Newfoundland Growlers for the Leafs. Um, I don't think he's played yet. I don't think that league has started up, but those are two players that are kind of interesting to keep an eye on. Uh, if the Leafs can find a way to move out a contract and make space for either of these guys. Uh, and then I'm looking at the Leafs roster and some contracts who they might be very keen to let go for uh, a waiver claim or a draft pick would be Wayne Simmons, Victor Mete, Kyle Clifford, uh, and the injured um, ben and Dahlstrom on defense. Um, with any luck, they can move either of those guys out, and, or two of them, and uh, and sign a couple of these uh, prospects that they have in their in their system, uh, either now or at the end of the season for Nyes. Okay, moving on from the Leafs. Uh, I talked a lot about Shane Wright last year in his draft year. He played in my town for Kingston, so I got to watch him a lot. I'm pretty pretty familiar with him, and I wasn't really sure where he was going to play this season. Um, my money was that he would start the year in the NHL and play at least nine games, and then we'll see. And so far, he started the year in the NHL. Seattle's played three games, and he's only played one. He's been a healthy scratch twice. He's got no points in the six minutes that he played in his first game. Um, I went to the game in Kingston last night, uh, October 15th, and they played Guelph, and he was not listed as one of the Kingston Frontenac's healthy scratches, which I thought was interesting, because typically teams that have players in the NHL still list them on their roster uh, as a healthy scratch. So I might be reading something out of nothing, it might just be an oversight on their part, they just might be thinking that he's just too good and there's no chance that they could be so lucky to have him come back. But they kept Zade Wisdom on their scratch list for half of the season last year when he was injured. And the season prior, he played the whole season in the American Hockey League during the pandemic where the OHL didn't play. Zade Wisdom played for Lehigh Valley Phantoms and was one of their best forwards, in fact. Um, so I didn't think that there was any chance that Zade Wisdom would return to the OHL after playing a strong season in the American Hockey League and perhaps it's because he had a shoulder injury that he missed the first half of the season that they decided that just let him get his feet under his and his and his timing back at the OHL for the second half of the season maybe go on a good run with Kingston who had a really good team 
Uh, but anyways, Kingston kept him on their, um, on their their roster list in the media room before every game as a healthy scratch, and I I couldn't help but notice that they're not doing that with Shane Wright. Um, not sure what that means, but if Seattle and Ron Francis, who has a history of being really patient with prospects, decides that the best thing for Shane Wright is to not eat popcorn in the press box and play sparingly in the occasional game that he gets into and that he's got 20 minutes a night waiting for him in the OHL with Kingston, uh, there's there's a really good chance that it looks like he could be coming back. Now, it might be after the World Juniors. Uh, Seattle might hold on to him till then. Um, that all remains to be seen. It's, it's certainly something that I'm very interested to watch. And my initial thought was, because Kingston had so many star players graduate last year with Martin Kromiak and Lucas Edmonds uh, and so on and so on, Zade Wisdom, uh, and that they would take a step back this year. Well, so far they're off to a fantastic start. They're 4-1-0-1. Oh, and, and their new goaltender, um, Ivan Jigalov, looks great. Uh, really impressed with him. Uh, so if he does end up getting sent back to Kingston, I'm not so sure that the France would look at trading him um that's still the conventional wisdom would say to do so after you know six games are off to a good start that does not make a championship season though uh and they could probably get a king's ransom for him in return as well um one last uh player and thought to talk about and this is a bit of a downer so i hate to end the podcast on this note but here we go scott perunovic i've talked a lot about him on the podcast too uh big fan of him I was watching him coming out of college thinking, here's a guy who's going to step into the NHL and be dominant. I'm looking at shades of you know Quinn Hughes and Cam McCarr. He's got that kind of offensive vision and skill. And unfortunately, coming out of college, he had an injury that ended his entire season, um, shoulder surgery on his left shoulder. So he missed all of 2021 20, season. Comes back next year. Uh, the American Hockey League um, starts the season there on fire, like 20 points in 12 games. Keep in mind, he's a defenseman, which is just absolutely crazy. Um, then he gets recalled to the NHL, 19 games there, has six points. That's pretty good for a defenseman rookie in the NHL. Um, and then... He gets an injury. He misses a month to COVID and an upper body injury. Comes back to end the season playing 12 games in the NHL, six more games in the American Hockey League total, uh, playing about 10 minutes a game. Uh, sorry, 12 games in the NHL and NHL with six points and playing about 10 minutes a game in the NHL. So clearly worse for wear after where he started in the season. And now he's got season ending ending uh surgery on his left shoulder again so missed a year played well for a half a year looks like he played injured for the last half and now he's going to miss all of 22 23 so this is really devastating news um it really makes it hard to to have confidence that his shoulder can sustain the rigors of professional hockey um and even if even if his shoulder is repaired and, and he's 100%, he's missed two years of key development. Uh, so it's really questionable if he can not only live up to his potential and come back. Um, the question I have is, is can he come back from this at all? Um, and will he be able to, to keep playing hockey or are those days over? So... That's a bit of a bummer. If you own Scott Perunovich like I do in, in your leagues, this was uh, this was the worst case news. Um, so let's just let's hope that he uh, that he comes around and he gets it all all back on the rails. All right, so that's all I got for this little short uh, season opener podcast. A couple of hot players to watch uh, very early in the season. Uh, remember, sh- send me a tweet uh, at dpr underscore show or at farling. Uh, let me know who you're. Uh, Go to fantasy guides are. Do you like them print? Uh, Do you prefer them in PDF? Do you you just like whatever's the cheapest one? Do you have certain features in them that you're that you absolutely love? I 
they're like my favorite thing. I, I love the the yearbooks. I refer to them throughout the year when I want to look up players or evaluate trades. Um, so I guess I'm a little old school that way, but I love them. So that's it for this episode. Thanks for listening. If uh, if you like the show, don't forget to subscribe. Uh, feel free to drop me a five star review or. If I talk about a player that you like and you want to share it with everyone, just kind of post it on Twitter or whatever. I'd appreciate all that. If you have questions that you want me to talk about on the show or you just want to ask me, shoot me a message there as well. That's it for now, everyone. Enjoy the games, and don't forget to set your rosters. Keep your stick on the ice.